Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Uh, my name is Alex Merriweather. On behalf of Harvard Bookstore, I'm very pleased to introduce this afternoon's Friday Forum with Jeffrey T. Schnapp and Matthew Battles discussing their new book from Harvard University Press, The Library Beyond the Book. Jeffrey Schnapp serves as the faculty director of Harvard University's MetaLab, a research and teaching community dedicated to exploring networked culture and devising transformative approaches to the use of technology in the classroom. Matthew Battles, Associate Director at MetaLab, is also the author of Library, An Unquiet History. Please join me in welcoming Jeffrey Schnapp and Matthew Battles. Um, thank you. Thank you, Alex. And it re it's a real pleasure and a privilege to be able to present this book here in uh, um, Harvard Bookstore, which is uh, not only across the street from my office, but it is a kind of pillar of, uh, of this uh, intellectual community, but a, a pillar that I think really has imaginatively innovative, innovated also vis-a-vis -vis what we expect of a bookstore, of the kinds of the potentiality of the bookstore as a physical place. And it's very pertinent to the larger argument that our book makes, which is uh, an argument about what libraries could and should become over the course of the 21st century during the digital era, when within the community of futurists, there was, at least for a moment, and there's still flickerings of it, a kind of effervescent sense that somehow the world of physical libraries would disappear into the, you know, the, the screen on your smartphone or on your laptop. And yet, what we see in, in practice is that libraries as physical places, not only uh, continue to be vital, but um, actually have seen their user statistics increase over time, uh, even during the digital era. And of course, we're printing more physical books than we ever have in the history of humankind at the same time as we're producing an increasingly wide proliferation of different other forms of, uh, of uh, other communication forms, uh, digital um, and digital means, of course, itself a variety of different kinds of media channels. Um, so our book is real, was really an attempt to, to sit down and think seriously and critically and also speculatively even about some, some core scenarios for what the future of libraries might be and emphasis on the S at the end of libraries. Not so much the library, but rather what would happen if the library as it has been interpreted in the course of history would undergo a series of really differentiated branched developments that would produce a world, a rich world, an even expanded world of libraries, of different typologies of knowledge and learning spaces. That's very much at the core of this endeavor. But what I'd really like to talk about here, and I'm gonna leave, I'm gonna hand over to Matthew the presentation of the core argument of the book, is to talk a little bit about this book as a book in the sense of as an object, because Library Beyond the Book is one of three books that have come out in a new Harvard University Press series entitled MetaLab, uh, MetaLab Projects. And they are books that are really trying to do, in a sense, something that um, is very much central to the argument of our, of our book in particular, which is really to try to reimagine the scholarly book itself. What is a scholarly book? What does knowledge look like in the 21st century? It sounds like a strange question, but it's a question that we have traditionally answered in the world of scholarly publishing um, by relying upon a series of conventions that are graphic, typographical, uh, print-based conventions that have not changed very much over the course of the past hundred years. Uh, and these are books, and this book in particular, are books that are really experimenting with a new, a, a kind of different concept of what a scholarly might, book might be. And it's a concept that's really focused on the idea of print not being a product, but being a moment in a process. In other words, this book is, has at its core a kind of classical skeleton, which is made up of, a, of an essay, an extended essay, but it has, it merges into that essay, it weaves around that essay, materials that you wouldn't find in a conventional scholarly book. For example, it begins with a cartoon. It's the, I've always wanted to publish a scholarly book that begins with a cartoon, and I finally fulfilled that dream. Um, it's a cartoon that Matthew and I scripted that was ex beautifully executed by a, a friend of ours, the artist uh, Joe Alterio, and it tells the stories of Melville Dewey, the inventor of the Dewey Decimal System, this prodigious innovator and thinker about the future of libraries at the, in the second half of the 19th century. 
who had his fingers in everything from classification systems to the design of furnish furnishings and devices for processing books, who built an enormous business empire around the production of library bureau, uh, the library bureau catalog, which was literally, you know, sold shelving systems, it sh sold stamps for stamping books, uh, who was involved in all of the major architectural debates about what an, a, a learning space should be, what a reading room should look like, how you should sit when you read, how you should spell English words. I mean, Dewey was this, pro was this prodigious figure. And we tell in the cartoon uh, the story of Melville Dewey, the time traveler, who goes back to visit the Library of Alexandria and then zooms forward into a future that looks like a kind of you know, a sort of a slightly steampunky version of the present where uh, library, where books have turned into these, uh, these you know, little electronic kind of halo-like objects and, and now flow through cables and wires into the, the, the lap of readers. Uh, and it's a serious, playful gesture that introduces a book in which the long form, the essay, which is one of, of course, the traditional scholarly forms of argument and discourse, is interwoven with a number of short forms. We have a whole section of windows, as you can see, and these are micro essays that um, typically go on uh, for less than a page and that look at, from a kind of micro perspective, at what the very ABCs of what we think of as a library, the equipment, like the carol, the library card, the card catalog, to look at those artifacts and to speculate, to, to examine their past, to excavate their past, but also to speculate about their future, to adopt this double optic, if you like, about excavating the past in order to think speculatively about the future of what, what does a carol look like in an age where reading or study or research means working across the analog phys digital divide, for example. Uh, and so the book weaves together short forms with long forms. It weaves together linear argument also with a, a kind of graphics design driven form. You can see that color is part of the story, but also we have a marginal text that flickers uh, in the form of provocations. These are little thought balloons thinking kind of provocatively and speculatively about what libraries might become. And um, those various elements are woven together in what attempts to be despite its heterogeneity, a coherent argument. A, an argument that allows readers, however, to engage with it from many different points, not just from the kind of classical scholarly book reading point, which is open the book, look at the table of contents, read from page one to the final page. But rather, these are books, this book in particular, that are designed to be read you can read them like a, a flip book with a series of provocations in the, in the margin. You can dive in at any number of junctures because there are materials that will respond to a, a much more kind of browsing mode of, of reading uh, to a much less linear process of engagement with the arguments. But the arguments nonetheless set out to be woven together in the same way you, and with the same kind of rigor that you would expect of a, a classical scholarly argument. So in short, this book series of which this is the lead book um, is really an attempt to redesign the scholarly book or to at least experiment with what scholarly books might look like in a universe where image and text are tightly woven together, where short forms and long forms intersect. And not only that, but where the book itself is not, is a self-contained unit to the degree that it functions autonomously but there are also pieces of it that live beyond the book, literally. In the case of Library Beyond the Book, the final chapter, which is called Cold Storage, which we'll be read you a little section from, is actually a kind of down payment on an interactive documentary that we're making right now that will be finished by the end of the year. It will be premiered. So what you get in the book is actually, it's like reading a script or it's a, a sort of test drive for a, a piece that will actually be fully expressed as a film. Uh, and indeed, the book itself has a website that supports it that has a series of other elements. The one that we're gonna draw from for this performance literally is a card deck. This card deck, which is a, something that we produced even before the book was published, uh, is actually a card deck made up of the provocations that are in the marginal inserts 
transformed into a classic deck of cards with jokers and aces and so forth. So the idea that publishing, that printing, that part of the revitalization of print culture that could be affected alongside a reimagining of the scholarly book uh, that involves a kind of multi-channeling approach to the way that we we, 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 we we situate a book as a print artifact in the midst of a series of other channels, of other products, of other expressions, all of which are interrelated, uh, is very much of the essence of this larger enterprise. And in the case of Library Beyond the Book, I want to mention just one last element, and that is even though Matthew and I wrote this book, the voices of a whole community of students who've been involved in a design studio at the Graduate School of Design focused on redesigning libraries, on reimagining, on studying, and also experimenting iteratively with um, ideas about library furnishings, about library policies, about how we could, um, in, in a sense, expand the range of functions that libraries perform in an environment like a university environment, those voices are quite sometimes literally present on the page in the form of the provocations. The provocations are actually culled from two years of running the uh, library test kitchen, which is this design studio that I was alluding to. So even though there's once again an attempt to try to get all of these heterogeneous materials to cohere and to weave together and to produce the same effect of argumentative effect of a traditional scholarly book, uh, it's a different way of approaching that task. And um, it's been uh, a lot of fun to um, participate in this uh, adventure. And um, I'm now gonna hand over the mic to Matthew to kind of lead you into the argument of the book itself. Great, well, thank you, Jeffrey. And, um, and thank you all for coming uh, and I just wanna, echo the, um, you know, the joy and the thrill that I always have when I come to Harvard Bookstore. This is a home game. Um, uh, my office now is on the other end of campus, so I don't get down here very often, um, being a good parochial Cantabrigian uh, now. But uh, I used to be in Houghton Library right here, just across the street, and I was over here three to five times a week plundering the remainder tables. So, um, so uh, I have very fond memories and continue to use this place um, frequently. Um, and, and, you know, as Jeffrey pointed out, the place is, uh, has, has been an innovative um, uh, uh, site and, and source for um, the experiences we associate with books um, over the last few years in particular, um, a site and a source that extends beyond itself. And um, that sense of beyond, that sense of transcendence with the little t, I think, is really core to our experience of the library and our arguments about what libraries are, what they have been, and what they might be in the future. Um, and what I'm gonna do is, is read a few um, excerpts from the book uh, to give you a sense of, of how that argument is kind of conjured up um, in, in, in over, the, over the course of, in particular, the kind of central essay um, that, that, that Jeffrey described, which, which functions much like a, a traditional essay. Uh, but this, you know, at the, at the core of all of this project is this sense that um, we wanted to understand the library beyond the form of the book, as, as tremendous as, as all of these objects in this space are to us, and as dear as they are to us, they're also all very different, right? Um, they have very different material histories, different intellectual histories, different economic histories, and different ways of being experienced by readers. Um, and as we begin to understand that, uh, we understand that the, the future for the, for the book um, and for the library by extension is likely to be a much more capacious one than I think the kind of um, dichotomous arguments that we often have um, would, would suggest. Um, there were, after all, libraries before there were books. Um, and, uh, and so we expect that libraries will continue to thrive, um, whatever form, um, information, knowledge, story, um, you know, the solid forms of language uh, take. So I'll read a bit, um, at first from the beginning, um, of the essay uh, uh, to give a sense of, of how we get into this um, question of the library beyond the book. The title of this volume is a provocation, not a description. It gestures toward a threshold being traversed at the time of writing, not toward an era when books will vanish and bookshelves will be seen only in virtual versions, brimming over only with ebooks. The threshold in question is made up of interlocking components, 
changes in the nature and status of the document and the book, changes in practices of reading, research, note-taking, and information sharing, changes in the architectural and institutional containers in which such practices are carried out and by means of which they're supported. It was arrived at, not suddenly, but slowly, not with the wave of a digital magic wand, but thanks to a century-long transformation in the culture of, of communication. Humanity has found itself on such thresholds before. Indeed, the modern predicament consists in precisely this posture on a brink, perpetually caught midway between taking a flight and a fall. These thresholds seem to arrive in ever shorter intervals, which have themselves at each half step like some kind of Hegelian riff on Moore's law, a logarithmic accelerando worthy of Zeno. Are we any closer to the, to the what? To the omega point, the apotheosis, the singularity? Now, perhaps more than at any other time in the last half millennium, we tumble along this corridor of thresholds, looking backward, angel of history-like, regarding the spectacle of shattered event horizons tossed together in a historiographic mise en abeam. Once the thre thresholds had piled up like a stairway to heaven, now jumbled they seem less a straight path than a hall of mirrors. We're midway on this journey beyond the book, and it's midway all the way down. While the beyond in our trouble may title, trouble the wary reader, reader it's worth remembering that there were libraries before there were books, if by books we mean the consumer product codex of the late 20th century, which arrived not only in the form of a certain apparatus and set of material attributes, but as a regime of market forces, institutional arrangements, physical and technical structures, which interact with the material in historically contingent ways. The book as we know it is often casually termed, quote, the invention of Gutenberg, although the goldsmith of 15th century Mainz would hardly know what to make of its barcode and ISBN, its digitally prepared text and typography, its wood pulp paper and covers of cloth and board or laminated paper stock, its precarious commodity network of printing plants, warehouses, and the market forces from pre-order to remainder, the many forms it takes to suit social situations as varied as church sermons, travel, early childhood play, puzzle solving, teaching, technical documentation, and the peculiar social and economic formations, bookstores, textbook depositories, mail order reading clubs, to name a few, which it has been adapted to suit. These paratextual elements are anything but accoutrement. They combined to lend the book its most powerful qualities in the late age of print, ubiquity, fungibility, a finely evolved balance of durability and disposability, the capacity to act as a consumer good that can be tracked from printing plant to bindery to shipping center to shop to resale network to pulping station. A quarter century before the new millennium, most books were already electronic books, composed with word processors designed in page layout software, produced on computer controlled presses. Their embodiment in pulp and ink long has been a kind of artifactual reverse apotheosis, a mystification of the divide between container and contained. Now, this conjuries we call the book, the mass market pulp, the trade hardcover, the paperback original, the coffee table volume, the limited edition, the technical manual, is a remarkably flexible typology in material culture. Even now it has a rich and diverse future, but the conditions in which it takes up its peculiar qualities today have not always obtained, nor will they obtain in the time to come. They will shift and change, raggedly and unevenly, in some dimensions more quickly and in novel directions. And as has happened in the past, such change will manifest in the material, in the physical shapes which knowledge takes and makes itself imminent. The domains of the material and social are never fully subordinate one to another, but everywhere interdependent upon and interactive with each other. As they change, as the book transforms, the material and institutional structures that express and reflect their peculiarities must transform as well. And through all of them runs the book beyond the book. Now, from, from this point, we begin to develop a kind of typology of these kinds of structures. Uh, we uh, look at a series of, of manifestations of the library, which, like the book, has gone through uh, a vast array of changes um, in this kind of transposition back and forth across the definitions of the container and the contained. Um, and our core argument really is that these, uh, these typologies, these forms, um, that the library has taken and that the book has taken are continually being picked up by um, the contemporary moment, uh, remixed to suit new conditions, uh, reinterpreted and reorganized. And so by extension, to think about the future of the library, to think about the future of the book, 
we might look to potential remixes and mashups of those past forms um, that libraries take. And I'll try to get us up to that point where we articulate what some of these forms are. Um, and these forms are forms that emerged in dialogue and conversation um, you know, with the, the design studio uh, that, that Jeffrey mentioned um, over a few years and have never felt like nor were they meant to be a kind of exhaustive typology. Uh, but the beginnings of a kind of pattern language, a, a, a set of conjectures for what books have been, what libraries have been, and, and ways they might be remixed um, in future times. So it's worth thinking through the ways in which the library has carried forward and catalyzed change in the meanings not only of reading, knowledge, and information, but the meaning also of the dead, the nature of their Congress with the living, the proprieties they hold over our institutions of education, knowledge transmission, and cultural production. And this idea develops out of the recognition that um, the library uh, in, in, in so many cases is a kind of, a kind of mausoleum, a kind of uh, house of the dead, a, a place where we commune with the spirit of the past. Death has always marked an epistemic as well as a material and ontological boundary. Do we now need to ponder the ways in which information networks variously elide and enable new formulations of the mortuary functions of knowledge production? Digital forms of information expression, after all, are rarely dead in the same way as the written letters Socrates warns against in the Phaedrus. And if you remember, uh, Socrates in that dialogue rather famously makes an argument against writing. Uh, writing, unlike living discourse, um, is unable to respond to change. Um, and this, and this um, concerns Socrates in ways that are familiar to us today in conversations about, I think, the effects of social media, the effects of network culture. Um, Socrates worried that our habits of mind would change, that we'd become less rigorous, uh, less reflective, less introspective, uh, as we relied less and less on oral discourse and more and more on written discourse. Uh, and so this is a, a, a concern that's been echoed down through the ages as media have changed and as the library has changed. In the form of software and digital data, written text can do things in the world, make copies of themselves, generate new texts or numerical expressions, transmediate themselves into new graphic and material modalities. These agencies are expressive. They're authored in much the same way as stories of old, and yet they take up residence in and alter the world in ways different from recited, printed, or handwritten texts. The library is both a cemetery and the library, a place of intensified, deeper sociality and communion, a place of burial and mummification that equals a place of worship and constant renewal, reactivation, and conversation across the centuries. As the storage slash entombment function of the book, as once understood, sets over the horizon, these activation functions again move to the fore. What are we going to do with all that space that was once devoted to storage, a form of stacks? What forms of conversation do we require or desire? The democratization of this once enclosed world is one of the great conquests of the modern era, one that has unleashed social forces, spread expertise, given rise to a vastly enriched universe of knowledge forms, and defined a new set of civic and public functions for temples of learning. Yet what will happen if it should merge into a million other spaces, losing its distinctiveness? The library is born as a container shaped by its contents. Like the tomb, its sacred meaning is intimately associated with the soma, the bodies that it houses. The structure itself thus is summoned into being, not along the lines of ideal or sacred geometries, not to serve the fulfillment of practical everyday tasks, but instead as the external manifestation of an internal treasure that needs at once to be manifest to the world of the living and protected, sheltered, locked up like a treasury or invisible reserve. Of course, the shape of those contents at any point is a matter not only of the physical volumes, but also their projections into the social, the political, the imaginal. Historically, the shape of that extended body, realized architecturally, has taken many forms. The mysterious grandeur of the Gothic, the rough-hewn piety of the Romanesque, the Carnegie Library's prim and simple classicism, the semi-translucent veined marble jewel box that is Yale's Beinecke Library, the latticed curtains wall skin of Seattle Public with its cantilevered geometries. Today, those bookish projections also take material, technical, and expressive shape by way of networked iteration. And I'll skip ahead just a little bit. Yet there is in the library something vast, something that always exceeds these dimensions. In its combinatory potential, its ambivalence, its polyglot drift across time, the collection of texts quickly overbalances the ambitions 
and intentions of its keepers. Throughout the history of libraries, the acquisitive mandate has supported, informed, and even been contradicted by an evolving typology of methods, affordances, and social arrangements, tool-like configurations of people and text using one another to do and make things. For purposes of projecting possible library futures, it's worth identifying and describing a few of these configurations of what libraries can do and be. We're not going to catch all of them, nor are we going to exclude explosions of the library into libraries, whether in the form of spin-offs or split-offs or novel ways of organizing the library's once predictable set of core organs. The configurations are many. As they emerge in history, they tend to endure, finding new application in new social-cultural situations. An institution often expresses more than one of them, and they are never found solely in libraries. We might start with the mausoleum, a place where the dead reside and where we go to commune with them. A cloister for reflection, meditation, and contemplation in shared solitude and labors of research and renewal. The database, a container for information that is classified, accessible, controllable, infinitely expansible. The sort of warehouse that we are later going to dub the Accumulibrary, library where the willy-nilly proliferation of documents and stuff is rendered navigable thanks to computational supports and mechanical eyes. A material epistemology where collocations and consanguinities among different kinds of knowledge are proposed, experimented with, and affirmed, and a series of library types untethered to collections, from mobile vectors to civic spaces, where public ties are forged and affirmed to freestanding reading rooms as spontaneous, popular, and often insurrectionary responses to closed and controlled versions of all of the above. So that's our basic typology, and in the balance of the book, the balance of the essay, per se, we take a look at historical examples of each of those, the mausoleum, the uh, accumulibrary, the database, etc. We look at examples of those across history and then think about ways um, that lessons from those, uh, from those specific examples might be applied or remixed in the present. And often in those cases, we look to present day configurations of these types, these forms, these metaphors. Um, that exist in, in libraries and other institutions uh, um, uh, in the world around us today. Uh, so that's the, the core argument. Um, and I think what we'd like to do now is maybe look at some of the, um, the other elements that intrude into that uh, core essay, um, in particular the provocations. Um, and maybe we'll just uh, deal out these cards right. to do that. Do you, you want to draw? Um, sure. Okay. We're going to read a few of these cards. <laughs> Stack U, flexible wired classrooms are carved out of existing stack structures, becoming hubs for the delivery of massive open online courses with on-site instructors. The walls of the enclosures become staging grounds for the bibliography and support materials for those ongoing online classes. Library, this is one that came up earlier. Libraries are beehives of activity, but much of that activity is invisible. The library is a touch screen that allows users to experience the life of the library in real time. Data flows, usage statistics, interlibrary flows, trending search patterns, books being taken out, returned, copied, and scanned. And share fair. In an economy increasingly requiring lifelong learning and shifting skill sets, libraries operate as places of barter and skill sharing exchanges with both analog and digital collections adapting to emerging trends and local needs. Some of the other uh, provocations in this deck of cards include libraries um, buried uh, uh, under layers of rock um, in the Arctic um, or the Antarctic, uh, libraries shot into space, and libraries encoded in the DNA of, of plants. Um, so there's quite a broad spectrum of possible futures for the library that are explored here. And you know, part of the um, fun of making this card deck um, was just the fun of designing and, and trying to think about um, these various conjectures as a kind of system, uh, as a kind of combinatory, um, replayable text, as it were, a way to reshuffle our own conjectures and contentions and see them in different kinds of relationships, something we argue libraries help us to do very, very nicely and have for a long time. And we also hope that you, know, you could use this deck in a kind of design game to think about ways to reimagine 
um, contemporary libraries. And in fact, it's been used that way. Um, we've been working with a, a, a design firm on uh, the redesign of um, digital affordances for a couple of major metropolitan library systems. And they've actually been using these, um, these provocations in their design thinking um, and have developed a number of um, really interesting experiences um, for these uh, metropolitan library systems out of dialogue with these, with these provocations. And that's been a fun process to be a part of. Um, one of these provocations in particular is for a, a performance librarian, a librarian who would do things like catalog a book or, or uh, uh, rebind a book, do conservation work, or scan a text and enter it into a, an online database in public and invite uh, people to participate in that process in the midst of the library space. Um, so, you know, we're hopeful that along with um, kind of serious uh, scholarly engagement in the essay um, and some playful elements uh, like, like graphic novel forms, um, there's also some, some practicality to this experiment in uh, conjecturing about the future of the library as well. Yeah. Back over there? Yeah. yeah. So, um, as Matthew was underscoring, the, the, the the card deck, which is made up literally of the provocations that run in the margin of the book, is, is really meant um, as a way of including in the conversation about libraries the kinds of people who often find themselves, for better or for worse, with the task of designing libraries for today and tomorrow, architects, designers. And when they confront this, they, of course, face a, a, a landscape that's hard to read right now. It's like, what does... Uh, how, how much importance should you attribute to all of those traditional design factors that have to do with shelving systems and storage in a world where we have this you know, proliferating set of hybridities? And so however ludic, uh, however playful the gesture of the cards and the provocations, they're really meant as a mechanism for expanding the conversation um, into a whole space of uh, design practice, thinking, speculation, uh, uh, but that's informed by history. Uh, I'm going to read um, from the windows, which serve as a kind of uh, transition between the introduction to the essay and the uh, core of the essay made up of the six scenarios that Matthew alluded to. Um, they represent another form of short content, not quite, a, not quite like tweet length uh, shortness, as in the case of the cards, but they give you also an idea of how this conversation about design is a conversation not just about the grand sort of architectural gestures that we associate with the history of libraries, past and present, you know, the, the, the cathedral of learning, you know, to cite only one powerful metaphor, but also about the implements and the devices that characterize those environments as knowledge environments, as learning environments. So I'm going to start with Carol. And these, each of these, as I said, are very, they're very short. They're, they're basically a couple paragraphs of text that juxtapose on one side images from the history of libraries of that particular device, and then patent uh, proposals of future, futuristic, sometimes sort of uh, slightly you know, visionary reinterpretations of those devices. So I'm going to start with Carol. The Carol belongs to a universe of furnishings that include the lectern, bookstand, writing table, and pew. Its origins are monastic, rooted in the Karula, the cloister-housed study nook. The modern Carol is the Karula's secular descendant. Stripped of ornament, chained, scriptures, and mantles of privilege, it is a document processing station for the age of critical reason. Designed for use rather than for ownership, the Carol is a desk that favors sorting, reading, and note-taking operations rather than personal storage and filing. Temporary constellations of knowledge march across its surfaces, one after another, en route towards publications, potential or actual, that loom invisibly over the horizon. Few will find readers or have hundred-year lives. Most will fade into the night sky like fireworks. The Carol's role as microcosm of retreat and enclosure within the macrocosm of the library is evolving towards interactive redesigns. The scenarios are multiple. The Carol as curation station, whose marching digital and physical constellations are broadcast to, literary, to library patrons. The modular Carol, they can be isolated or assembled into islands. The Carol as classroom. The Carol as multimedia production studio. 
retreat and enclosure will remain an integral part of this future, but in the company of designs for advance and disclosure. And I'll read you just one other before we um, conclude here, which is the, um, there are eight of these micro histories that serve, that, that assume the form of windows in the book. Uh, the one dedicated to library cards. So the library card. The library card is a passport to a world in which access to libraries has been democratized and the lending of books confirms their civic vocation. Its double is the circulation record. It anoints the bearer as a citizen or citizen in the making played, pledged to treat every book as an expression of the res publica, the public thing. The library card is born a minimalist. At most, it displays a name, address, number, expiration date, and library seal. An ancestor of the wallet-sized credit card, it initially assumes the form of an embossed surface that prints under the pressure of rollers or frottage. These dumb beginnings as a meager press form have not been overcome through the addition of barcodes or magnetic stripes, but the library card is about to get smart, and smart means biometric forms of identification, the ability to carry a reader's entire history of searches, loans, and scans, use for payment of special services, interoperability across institutions, a social fingerprint capable of tapping into the bearer's broader network of interests. The library card of the future will be born a maximalist. Um, now, just to conclude, um, um, Matthew's going to just present from the appendix to the book. The book ends, the essay ends with a, an appendix that, as I alluded to before, is actually the, the screenplay for a documentary that um, will be complete at the end of the year, although we're beginning to roll out features of it. It's part of an experiment, an experiment with what is sometimes called the web documentary. There's a 20-minute classic documentary at the core of it, which is itself a re reworking, a reinterpretation of Alain René's 1957, All the Memory of the World, the beautiful documentary that the great French director, recently deceased, dedicated to the National Library of France. Uh, it's uh, an art film, which is entitled Cold Storage, it, which serves as a kind of node within this broader set of materials that document um, uh, document the Harvard Depository, which is the structure within which the, the bulk of uh, the books that make up the Harvard Library um, system are stored, um, is entitled Cold Storage. And it's, it's really, um, it's, a, it's a film that is prefaced in a sense in this final chapter of the book that really is exploring what we think, I think, within MetaLab as really the core challenge of the digital age, which is not the digital per se, but it's those bridges between the digital and the analog world. And um, the Harvard Depository, which is this uh, offsite structure located in Southborough, Massachusetts, that holds something like close to 10 million volume, or what is it? Is it 16? I'm sorry, I, I may have the numbers wrong. <laughs> uh, yeah. Yeah, um, doc, of course there's archives and films and a whole set of very heterogeneous materials that are stored there. But uh, so I think books is around eight or nine million and then there's a, other kinds of records there as well. Um, it's this extraordinary structure that's made a very physical kind of structure but that is held together by information systems. And it's this merging of physical architectures with information systems that seems to us in some kind of fundamental way to crystallize the, si the, the, the question of the library today. Uh, a library that where books have not gone away and they are not going away. We continue to produce more and more and yet it's also a library where we have all these other document forms that are prol proliferating, swarming around, um, sometimes repeating what exists in print, sometimes diverging from, from, from print and trying to imagine a world, a physical world, a physical set of structures, uh, the kinds of social spaces that where those two come together productively is really what we think of as the core task here. So um, with that, I'm gonna hand over the mic back to Matthew. Right, so, so the depository, it's, it's, it's an extraordinary place and a place that very few of us get to, to visit. And, and uh, so we felt very fortunate to have had a number of opportunities to spend extended time at the depository. It's, an important ingredient in my experience of the library um, as well, 
Harvard library system in particular because my first job here, uh, before I was an editor, before I taught classes, before I worked at Metalab, um, uh, was uh, basically to send half a million books to the depository from <laughs> Widener Library, um, which was not a terribly popular um, thing to do at the time. Um, but the depository has really become knit into the information infrastructure of the experience of, of, of um, the library and life at the university, as offsite storage has for many library facilities. Um, it's out of sight and out of mind for most library patrons, much like information systems that we're familiar with using on our mobile devices or our laptops or our tablet computers. And yet those systems are made up of people and relationships, um, as well as material things and information networks. And so our exploration of this uh, distant site uh, where so many books and other materials are kept um, is an exploration of those relationships and an attempt to, to kind of tease them out and celebrate them as well. So during the day, the HD, as we call the depository, has a monastic cast and a nocturnal feel. There's little talk and a great deal of sorting, lifting, stacking, and loading, both in forward and reverse. Most of the stacks are cloaked in darkness. The few that are not whir and squeal to the tune of forklifts performing the day's optimized paths of restitution and retrieval. At night, the HD is freed from the distractions inflicted by the paper cruncher's proxies. As soon as they complete their appointed rounds, the decisive light switch is thrown, the last security code entered, and deadbolts bring the doors into lockstep with the walls. The hum of surveillance cameras and cooling fans recedes into the background. The vault is sealed tight. An epiphany can be delayed no more. Two competing tales are told about the event that is believed to transpire every night at midnight, even if unheard by mortal ears and unseen by mortal eyes. According to some, music erupts. The celestial song of millions of works recorded in every medium, in every language, in every country that has ever existed is sung. According to others, a deafening silence reigns in the midst of a no less sublime spectacle of universal immobility. Books rub up against other books, typefaces touch in secret, imperceptible conversations are carried on across the shelves and across the centuries that deride the petty illusions of the living. Molecular mutations gnaw away at monuments of celluloid and cellulose that have successfully stood every test that time has thrust their way. Dust motes dance and dart. Our collective art filled with petabyte upon petabyte of memories sets sail on the sea of history. Humankind's noblest endeavor. Oblivion is the destination. And that's how we conclude. <laughs> well, thank you thank all you. very much. I'm happy to take questions. And I think, I, I think as I hope is clear, one, one of the things we're, you know, we, neither of us is a professional librarian. And, and so the, the enterprise of taking on, you know, I mean, there's a, this is a terrain where there's some very rich and complicated conversations that have been going on for a very long time. And one of the advantages is the freedom that we have, in a sense, to come into that, onto that terrain, maybe with a fresh set of eyes and also setting out, I think, as Matthew said explicitly, to really try to break down some of those kinds of impasses that tend to really polarize the conversation around either or propositions. Uh, mm -hmm. Because mm -hmm. in fact, the, uh, the, the world of, you know, the kind of craft world of m metadata produced according to the kinds of schemes that have historically been developed over the course of the 19th and the 20th century is, is not inherently in conflict with a world where uh, that's keyword based and where audiences, uh, you know, user populations generate a uh, significant amount of uh, data that can also serve as metadata as an access point. And, um, and so trying to really fully imagine those sorts of scenarios where we have convergences between models that seem right now institutionally for all kinds of reasons to be in a conflict, in, in a kind of battle, is, is very much what I think the spirit of the book, and it's also the spirit of a lot of the work MetaLab has done in other areas of like developing interfa uh, interface design, really trying to imagine how we build on that history of description that metadata standards represents new capabilities that don't sacrifice the strength of those models. And, and of course, that's, a again, a kind of freedom that one has when one isn't fighting for resources inside an organization. But, but we hope that by modeling 
those worlds that we begin to change the conversation, I guess is what I would say. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, um, the sort of dynamics inherent in, in institutional life, um, you know, are take the form of zero-sum games um, all too often, don't they? And that's long been the case. That was the case long before computers um, arrived on the scene. And, uh, and, and so any kind of opportunity um, uh, to split hairs, um, uh, to divide camps is, is often seized on. And certainly I think um, the, the, uh, the practices of cataloging have become one of those contested territories. And you know, I do think that it's um, certainly implicit in our approach, and I think it, it comes out um, throughout the book that we don't think that those kinds of either or um, kind of you know Solomonic um, judgments are are really are very useful or very practical. And furthermore, metadata is uh, is dear to Meta Labs' heart. Our our research group um, we spend a lot of time thinking about what metadata are, where they come from, who makes them, and how those practices have changed over time. Because those tell us about. Um, the ways in which we've understood the library, the ways in which we've understood books and learning and sharing ideas. Um, uh, you know, from the very start, my experience of the library has been that it's a kind of big book, um, you know, a vast text that's authored by this enormous community. Um, and, and many of the members of that community are the catalogers who describe these things. Um, at the same time, we also realize that those, you know, past states of the description um, and, uh, and accounting procedures that have been used to classify and order books um, have also been limited and constrained by their time frames. I mean, you know, the old Widener classification scheme is full of these kind of rich artifacts of turn of the last century epistemology. There's an ought class for the Ottoman Empire, you know? <laughs> um, you know, you, you look, the, the classification scheme for um, British history is like three volumes that are this thick, you know? Um, I mean, it reflects a, a mid, uh, you know, a kind of, you know, when, the, when the, you know, the sun never set on the British Empire kind of um, experience of, of the world of learning. Um, and by the same token, today, metadata information about information, for those who are not so wonky about this sort of thing, is being generated by systems all around us all the time. I mean, there's metadata being generated right now in this, in this, in this context, um, not only in the form of recordings of us, um, but also the, you know, the, the cash registers are recording metadata um, about who's purchasing books and when they're being purchased and which books are being purchased. These all tell stories and, um, there are many systems, many craft practices for activating and animating those streams of description and classification, stories that machines are beginning to tell um, at our behest and request, as well as people. So finding multiple ways for those people and systems to fruitfully interact with each other. I think that begins in all of us as um, users, as, as, as the case would have it today culturally, as, as thinkers and, and doers and makers of knowledge and sharers of knowledge, we need to be sensitive to how these, how these data, how these information, bits of information emerge and, and come together. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think that's a, a it's, it, it's a really key example because I think the, the public library movement, which was this transformative movement, I mean, it, 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 it's a, 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 as powerful as, you know, pu public education uh, and, and certainly walking hand in hand. Um, made a whole series of assumptions about the need for a kind of core set of universal tools, you might say, and a core, a core set of assumptions accompanied that also about what are socially meaningful forms of access to information and knowledge. And, and I think, as you were already implying in the way you phrased the question, it's not so clear that that is the case today at all. Some of those needs are being provided by other institutions. Some of them are no longer so clearly universalizable. <laughs> uh, to use a long word, but <laughs> a word that I think car captures a little bit of some of some of the challenges that are involved. And you know, one of the arguments that's a more polemical argument, but it's meant to really provoke, to stimulate the imagination about how we reinterpret these institutions that are so fundamental, that have been so fundamental, like public libraries, like branch public libraries, like neighborhood libraries that we, uh, one of the provocations we make is particularly in, this, in the sixth scenario, which, which is focused on, on the notion of mobile or pop-up or momentary or evanescent kinds of concepts of the library, is really to think hard about 
a model that that gives up on this idea of universal knowledge and that really thinks about situational and located knowledge, that thinks about public libraries in particular, particularly branch public libraries, the, the kinds of libraries that were never really research places, but that were always civic institutions in some kind of deep sense, and to think about what it means to be such a civic institution in a given location, and to think about it in terms of where you add value, where you can transform, where you can literally become a site for addressing social problems. Um, so to adopt a more tactical, strategic, situational concept of the library, but that's reprogrammable without giving up the idea of a stable site where such operations are carried out. So I think that Matthew read in one of the sections he read a, an allusion at least to the idea that that online education might have a particular home in public libraries. That seems like one of the many threads in that argument, but another could be that public libraries deploy themselves to become the sites where social, uh, fundamental social challenges are addressed without uh, necessarily abdicating the notion that uh, they will be stable institutions, that they don't have to just become pop-up libraries. Uh, and, and we think that's a universe that would actually enrich um, in a sense, uh, and, and also answer some of the kinds of fundamental political and social questions that, that public libraries face continuously, which has to do with funding and with support. And, um, so, uh, so the idea of, of thinking local, like kind of uh, uh, maybe reinforcing the sense of local responsibility and getting away from this sort of universal knowledge, Pro, 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 you know, provision of universal knowledge model, which which is more a myth than a reality to begin with. Most, if you look at actual usage of public libraries, um, outside of the kind of feature showcase libraries like New York Public and Boston Public, if you look at the kind of world of branch public libraries, of which, of course, there are many, many thousand in a country like the United States. You see that many of their the functions they're providing are basic civic and um, socio political functions. They're not just about access to knowledge. So in some places, it's the place where broadband is available, uh, in, in other places, for especially disenfranchised populations. In other places, it's where you get job information. In other places, it, it's you know an extension of the school classroom. Um, and we think that there are some powerful opportunities there for taking these physical plants and giving them new social meanings. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the major and most insidious dangers that the public library faces is the fact that it's associated with this with this with these kind of dearly held um, traditional norms and assumptions that, that are tied to this, this the, the virtues of universal knowledge, as it were. Yeah. Right, well that's, put, no, put those, those, and... <laughs> no that, those are, that is, that is the kind of oil and water mixture that, that we're dealing with. And um, when that provision of universal knowledge is um, accessible by other means, um, you quickly run into the argument that there's no use for this institution any longer. Sure, and libraries, you know, and public libraries are doing that all over the place. I mean, there's a wonderful um, experiment going on in, in uh, Chattanooga, Tennessee, uh, where um, the fourth floor of, of the public library, right in downtown Chattanooga, it's this vast um, hangar-sized warehouse space, where, which used to be the, the system's depository. Um, for the off-site storage of books. It's not a new thing. Um, libraries have been storing books off-site for a long time. This happened to be on top of the main library, but this was the depository for branch libraries as well. Um, well, they've moved that off-site depository farther off-site and opened that space up for all kinds of new uses, some of which um, take civic forms, some of which take kind of design and making form. There are, um, you know, there are craft fairs that happen in there and, and quilting expositions, digital design expositions. You can go up there and use a 3D printer or a laser cutter, gain access to tools. Now these are tools for producing knowledge in the 21st century, not just tools for making physical things, but for thinking through the making of things. And that's, those are becoming the, the you know, new ways added to all the old ways of producing knowledge. And so the library, you know, to make itself relevant, it needs to be participating in those new ways of, of making knowledge and making them accessible the way we like to think public libraries have done in the past, remembering, of course, that, you know, that's, those are, you know, those norms and those, those virtues, those ideals were not infrequently um, breached. I mean, you know, libraries in the South um, at the turn of the last century were not merely, um, you know, uh, 
accidentally tarnished with Jim Crow. They were instruments of Jim Crow. And in many experiences, um, uh, disadvantaged people, people who don't have the kind of cognitive endowments that we associate with learning, libraries can be very forbidding. I mean, you walk into the New York Public Library off of Fifth Avenue, um, the place that is celebrated as the temple of, of you know, um, uh, of the public library. I mean, it's the public library par excellence, and you have no idea what to do with this place. I mean, it is a very forbidding space, you know? So, you know, libraries have been contesting and contending with contradictory stories all along, and we continue to do so now. Um, and finding ways for that to be a civic dialogue that we all participate in, uh, that's, I think, crucial to the future. I think. Again, what we've meant by the word book over the course of the history of, of um, not just print culture, but you know, sort of the, the, the history of the codex form, which the print culture embraces and then interprets over the course of six centuries, um, has varied enormously from one period to the other. Um, and um, you know, these, um, I think, as the production of knowledge and the com com communication of knowledge, the publishing of knowledge, the sharing of it, um, assumes the kinds of shapes that it's assuming today, where sometimes projects are really born digital. Uh, they are really, they don't lend themselves necessarily to print at all. Uh, there are entire fields, disciplines, scholarly disciplines that have struggled with print as a medium, however powerful print has been. And it's been not only powerful, but transformative with respect to, um, to the whole world of learning um, over many centuries. Um, those forms, uh, you know, I think will naturally uh, gravitate towards the places where they express themselves with the greatest freedom and uh, ease. And these books, um, the, the genre of book that we're trying to experiment with through the Metal Lab project series, um, are really tr trying to think about, um, I mean, it really comes back to your question about memory, about the long duration of knowledge. So dig these digital forms I was just alluding to, um, in the case of, for instance, work with big data that produces visualizations that are interactive in their very nature, um, that work is tremendously powerful. It opens up all kinds of really rich and interesting avenues. We have whole fields of the sciences that are, have largely been built in, a, in spaces like that, particularly like in bioinformatics and uh, genomics. Um, the flip side of that is that digital data is extremely fragile. Uh, it's extraordinarily fragile. And uh, many early digital humanities and arts projects have vanished with the throw of a switch um, forever. Uh, and what exists of them as documentation is our traces, uh, rather fragmentary traces. So in answer to your question, one of the things we think is interesting, and what, in the two other books in this series, um, each of them, in a sense, starts with a digital project. There's a print support for a digital original, you might say, so a kind of reversed uh, you know, sort of priority, is that this form of uh, kind of uh, multi-channel publishing of multiple forms of documentation creates a rich set of possibilities for linking natively digital knowledge forms to other forms and linking across media and linking across even you know sort of genres of of argument and so forth um, i described some of the aspects of that with respect to this book but um uh with res if, if we were talking about the two other books that were in the lead sequence of books launched as part of the series i think that point becomes even more explicit um, uh, it's extraordinarily difficult to preserve and constantly it ensure access to many natively digitally produced scholarly forms. Um, and we think print, especially a kind of reinvigorated model of print culture, which is what we're trying to experiment here with, drawing on lessons from the avant-garde, lessons from uh, you know, all kinds of moments in the history of tw certainly 20th century um, uh, book design. We think there's a happy universe where the the, the, those two cultural threads interact, are woven together, intersect one another, and that offers a, not a guarantee that, it, we can, you know, total preservation has always been a myth, a kind of fantasy, but where at least we have a model that's a sustainable model so that these knowledge forms don't actually live this extremely perilous life where literally the disappearance of a virtual world platform or whatever, whatever the technological environment in, is, is in which something is produced 
could literally go away except to be captured in the form of a bunch of screenshots. Uh, so this is a digital project. This is a book that's infused with elements that come from that project, but it is not a simply, you know, uh, it is not translatable into a PDF. In fact, we haven't released this book. The electronic form of this book is a whole series of tentacular extensions. And so there is an experiment with a publishing model that doesn't look at the digital and the analog worlds as one, like two different containers you can throw the same stuff into, but rather that really tries to express specific affordances of each, uh, but that complement one another. I mean, that's the, that's the fantasy, at least, whether we succeed or not in doing so. Is to be determined. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank you all. Thank you. Thank you.